All right, hey guys. So we are going to pick back up today with chapter five. And um, so remember these videos are totally optional for you guys. Um, I just know some of you guys are auditory learners, which means you like it uh, being read to you so you can follow along better that way. But if you are an independent reader, then you are more than welcome to read this chapter on your own. All right, so let's pick up with chapter five. All right, so let's review really quickly what happened in chapter four. So chapter four, um, this was when Atticus caught the kids playing the Boo Radley game and they got into a little bit of trouble. Um, and then we see at the very, very end that Scout actually heard somebody in the first time, uh, for the first time inside the Radley house itself. So very, very spooky um, mood that's being set here. Okay, so let's look at chapter five. So she says, my nagging at the better of Jim eventually, and as I knew it would, and to my relief, we slowed down for the game for a, for a while. He still maintained, however, that Atticus hadn't said we couldn't, therefore we could. And if Atticus ever said we couldn't, Jim had thought of a way around it. He would simply change the names of the characters, and then we wouldn't be accused of playing anything. Remember here they're talking about playing that Boo Radley game where they are pretending that they are Boo Radley themselves. <clears throat> Dill was in a hearty agreement with this plan of action. Dill was becoming something of a trial anyway, following Jim about. He had asked me earlier in the summer to marry him, then he promptly forgot about it. He had asked me earlier in the summer, or I'm sorry, he asked me, um, he had stacked, stalked me out, marked at his property, um, marked as his property, and I was the only girl he would ever love, and then he neglected me. I beat him up twice, but it did no good. He only grew closer to Jim. They spent days together in the treehouse, plotting and planning, calling me only when they needed a third party. But I kept aloof from their more foolhardly schemes when, uh, for a while. And on the pain of being a girl, I spent most of my remaining twilights that summer sitting with Miss Maudie Atkinson on her front porch. So this, um, this is the first time we really see, uh, or really the second time that we see this, this line being drawn and those gender roles being developed in the text where you have Scout is being um, kind of put out because she's a girl and Jim and Dill are kind of sticking together because they are boys, right? Um, and this chapter kind of helps develop that idea. <clears throat> Jim and I had always enjoyed the free run of Miss Maudie's yard if we kept out of her azaleas, but our contact with her was not clearly defined. Until Jim and Dill excluded me from their plans, she was only another lady in the neighborhood, being relatively benign presence. So she's just um, an old woman that lives next door to the kids. Our tacit treaty with Miss Maudie was that we could play on her lawn, eat her scuppernogs if we didn't jump on the arbor, and explore her vast back lot terms so generous we seldom spoke to her so careful were we to preserve our delicate balance of our relationship but jim and dill drove me closer to her with their behavior miss monty hated her house time spent indoors was time wasted she was a widow a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds um, in an old straw hat and men's overalls and after her five o'clock bath she would appear on the porch and rain over the streets in mysterious uh, beauty she loved everything that grew on god's earth even the weeds with one exception if she found a blade of nutgrass in her yard it was like the second battle of the marne she swooped down upon it with a tin tub and subjected it to the blast from beneath a poisonous substance she called, she said was so powerful, it'll kill us all if we didn't stand out of the way. Why can't you just pull it up? I asked after, after witnessing a prolonged campaign against a blade not three inches high. Pull it up, child, pull it up. She picked up the limp sprout and squeezed her thumb um, up its tiny stalk microscopic grains ooze out. Why, one sprig of nut grass can ruin a whole yard. Look here, when it falls down, this dries up and the wind blows it all over Maycomb County. Miss Maudie's face likens such an occurrence upon an Old Testament pestilence. Her speech was Chris for a Maycomb County inhabitant. She called us by all of our names and when she grinned, she revealed two minute gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. When I admired them and hoped that I would some have some eventually, she said, look here, 
With a click of her tongue, she thrust out her bridge work and her gesture of corality that cemented our friendship. So she has dentures in her mouth. Miss Maudie's benevolence um, extended to Jim and Dill whenever they paused in their pursuits. We reap the benefits of a talent Miss Maudie had hitherto kept hidden from us. She made the best cakes in the neighborhood. And when she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked, she made a big cake and three little ones. She would call across the street, Jim Finch, Scout Finch, Charles Baker Harris, come here. Remember, Charles Baker Harris is Dill. We know his nickname is Dill, but that's his, his real name. Our promptness was always rewarded. In, summer twi in summertime, twilights are long and peaceful, often as not. Miss Maudie and I would sit silently on her porch, watching the skies go from yellow to pink as the sun went down, watching flights of um, martins sweep low over the neighborhood and disappear behind the schoolhouse rooftops. Miss Maudie, I said one evening, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur, and he's alive, she said. She was rocking slowly in her big oak chair. Do you smell my mimosa? It's like angel's breath this evening. Yes, um, how do you know? Know what, child? That Bo Mr. Arthur is still alive. What a morbid question. But I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Maybe he died and they stuffed him up the chimney? Where did you get such a notion? That's what Jim said he thought they did. Shh. He gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Maudie had known my Uncle Jack Finch. Um, Atticus's brother, since they were children, nearly the same age they had grown up together at Finch's Landing, and Miss Maudie was the daughter of a neighboring landowner, um, Dr. Frank Buford. Dr. Buford's um, profession was medicine, and his obsession was anything that grew in the ground, so he stayed poor. <laughs> Uncle Jack Finch combined his passion for digging in window boxes in Nashville that stayed rich and stayed rich. When we saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he would yell across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. Miss Maudie would yell back, call a little louder, Jack Finch, and they'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. <laughs> Jim and I thought this was a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage, but then Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Maudie's goat, and that he had been he had been trying unsuccessfully for 40 years and that he was the last person in the world Miss Maudie would think about marrying, but the first person she thought about teasing. And the best offense to her was a spirited offense, all of which we understood clearly. Arthur Radley just stays in the house, that's all, said um, Miss Maudie. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, but I want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. You know the story as well as I do. I never heard why, though. Nobody ever told me why. Miss Maudie settled her bridge work. You know, old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. That's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Don't you all believe in foot-washing? We do at home in the bathtub. Well, we can't have communion with you all apparently, deciding it that it was easier to define primitive baptistry than closed communion, Miss Maudie said, foot washers believe anything that's a pleasure is a sin. Did you know some of them came out of the woods one Saturday and passed my place and told me me and my flowers were going to hell? Your flowers too? Yes, ma'am. They'd burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. My confidence in the pulpit gospel lessened at the vision of Miss Maudie stewing forever in various Protestant hills. Sure enough, she had an acid tongue in her head, and she did not go about the neighborhood doing good, and as did Miss Stephanie Crawford. But while no one with a grain of sense trusted Miss Stephanie, Jim and I had considerable faith in Miss Maudie. She had never told on us, had never played cat and mouse with us. She was not at all interested in our private lives. She was our friend. So how a re so so how so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. That ain't right, Miss Maudie. You're the best lady I know. Miss Maudie grinned. Thank you, ma'am.
Thing is, foot washers think women are sin by definition. They take the Bible literally, you know. Is that why Mr. Arthur stays in the house? To keep away from women? I have no idea. That doesn't make sense to me. Looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Atticus says, God um, loving folks like to love yourself. Miss Maudie stopped rocking and her voice hardened. You're too young to understand it, she said. But sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of um, oh, your father. It's a very powerful statement, she just said. I was shocked. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey, which again, this shows how young a scout is because she doesn't understand uh, that metaphor that she's trying to create there. He never drank a drop in his life. No, ma'am. Yes, he did. He said he drank some one time and he didn't like it. Miss Maudie laughed. Wasn't talking about your father, she said. What I meant was if Atticus drank until he was drunk, he wouldn't be as hard as some men at their best. There are just some kind of men who, who are so busy about the next world that they've never learned to live in this one. And you can look down the street and see the results. Do you think they're true? All those the, uh, things they say about Bo Mr. Arthur. Remember, Boo is Mr. Arthur. What things? I told her. That is three-fourths color folks and one-fourth Stephanie Crawford. Remember, Stephanie Crawford uh, is that town busybody said Miss Maudie grimly. Stephanie Crawford even told me once she woke up in the middle of the night and found him looking in the window at her. I said, what did you do, Stephanie? Move over in the bed and make room for him? That shut her up for a while. <laughs> I sure I did. Miss Maudie's voice was enough to shut anybody up. No, child, she said. That's a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me, no matter what folks said he did. He spoke as nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? Miss Maudie shook her head. If he's not, he should be by now. The things that happen to people, we never really know. What happens in houses behind closed doors? What secrets? I kiss don't ever do anything to Jim and me in the house that he don't do in the yard. I said, feeling it my duty to defend my parent. Gracious child, I was raveling a thread. Wasn't even thinking about your father. But now that you... But now that I am, I'll say, Atticus Finch is the same in the house as he is on the public streets. How would you like some fresh pound cake to take home? I'd like it very much. Next morning, when I awakened, I found Jim and Dill in the backyard deep in conversation. When I joined them, as usual, they said, go away. Well, not this yard's as much as mine as it is yours, Jim Finch. I, just as much, I got just as much a right to play in it as you have. Dill and Jim emerge from a brief huddle. If you stay, you got to do what we tell you, Dill warned. Well, I said, who's so high and mighty all of a sudden? If you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't going to tell you anything, Dill continued. You act like you grew 10 inches in a night. All right, what is it? Jim said placidly, we're going to give a note to Boo Radley. Just how? I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. It was all right to talk to Miss, for Miss Maudie to talk. She was all in snug on her porch. It was different for us. Jim was merely going to put a note at the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring a bell. <laughs> Dill raised his right hand. In it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going around to the side of the house, said Jim. We looked yesterday from across the street, and there's a shutter loose. Maybe you think I could make a stick. Uh, maybe I can make it stick on the window sill, at least. Jim, now, now you're in it, and you can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Pris. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch. Jim, somebody was, yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's going to watch the front of the house and up the street. And if anybody comes, he'll ring the bell. That clear? All right, then. What you writing? Dill said, we're asking him politely to come out sometimes and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him, and we buy him an ice cream. You've all gone crazy. He'd kill us. Dill said, it's my idea. I figured he'd come out and sit a spell with us. He might feel better. How do you know he don't feel good? 
Well, how'd you feel if you've been shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here. Like your daddy's? He ain't got a beard. He still stopped as if trying to remember. So this is kind of an indicator that we know that Dill's been lying a lot about um, his family and about um, kind of where he's, where he grows up. Uh-huh. Gotcha. I said, you said before you were on a train, you were off the train. Good. And your daddy had a black beard. If it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah. And I've got a letter to prove it. He sent me $2 too. Keep on. I reckon he even sent you a mounted police uniform. And that'll never show up, did it? You just keep on telling him, son. Dill Harris could tell the biggest ones I've ever heard talking about lies. Among others, he had been up in the mail plane 17 times, had been to Nova Scotia, had seen an elephant, and his granddaddy was Bitta, uh, Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him a sword. All right, so we'll learn later in the text why um, why Dill feels the need that he needs to lie. You all hush, said Jim. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk? Anybody who's brave enough to go up to the house had a, had an ought to use a fishing pole, I said. Why don't you just knock on the front door down? This is different, said Jim. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jim. The three of us walked cautiously towards the old house. Dill remained at the light pole in the front corner of the lot, and Jim and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jim and stood where I could see around the curve. All clear, I said, not a soul in sight. Jim looked up at the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jim attached the note to the end of the fishing pole and let the pole out across the yard and pushed it down towards the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough, and Jim leaned over as far as he could. He watched him making jabbing motions for so long, I abandoned my post and went to him. Can't get it off the pole, he muttered. Or if I got it off, I can't make it stay. Go on back down the street, Scout. I returned and gazed around the corner at an empty road. Occasionally, I looked back at Jim, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground, and Jim would jab it up until I thought Boo Bradley ever received it. He wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulders up, I reeled around to face Boo Bradley and his bloody flings. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. So think about how Atticus is going to feel seeing what his kids are doing. Jim looked so awful. I didn't have the heart to tell him. Uh, I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole right behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, stop ringing that bell. Jim grabbed the clapper in the silence that followed. I wish he'd start ringing it again. Atticus pushed his hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips. Jim, he said, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was, we were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. We were trying to give him just a letter. Let me see it. Jim held out a filthy piece of paper and Atticus took it and tried to read it. Why do you want Mr. Radley to come out? Dill said, we thought he might enjoy us. And he dried up when Atticus looked at him. Son, he said to Jim, I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man that goes for the other two of you when mr radley did was his own business and if we wanted to come out and if he wanted to come out he would and if he wanted to stay in his own house he had the right to stay inside free from the intentions of inquisitive children which was a mild term for the likes of us how would you how would we like it if atticus barged in on us without knocking and we were in our rooms at night we were in effect doing the same thing to mr radley what Mr. Radley did might seem peculiar to us, but it did not seem peculiar to him. Furthermore, had it never, ever, never occurred to us that the civil way to communicate with another being was by the front door instead of the side window. Lastly, we were to stay away from the house until we were invited there. We were not to play an asinine game he had um, seen us playing or make fun of anybody on the street or in this town. 
we're not making fun of him. We weren't laughing at him, said Jim. We were just, so that's what you were doing, wasn't it? Making fun of him? No, said Atticus, putting his life's histories on display for the edification of the neighborhood. Jim seemed to swell a little. I didn't say we were doing that. I didn't say it. Atticus grinned dryly. You just told me, he said. You stop this nonsense right now, every one of you. Jim gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm as if he were trying to hold it in line. Jim decided there was no point in quibbling and was silent. When Atticus went inside the house to retrieve a file he had forgotten to take to work that morning, Jim finally realized that he had been done in by the oldest lawyer's trick on record. He waited a respectful distance from the front steps, watched Atticus leave the house, and walked towards town. When Atticus was far out um, of earshot, Jim yelled out for him, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I ain't so sure now. All right, that is the end of chapter five. All right, so Atticus gets onto the kids again uh, for playing this, this Boo Radley game. But we also get to see a little bit more about Boo's family and the fact that they are um, – kind of they think that they're superior to everyone else and it kind of helps us uh kind of understand a little bit more of what's going on behind those doors all right so that is the end of chapter five bye guys